Tom. It's our telephone number. Wide open telephones on this Friday. On the Tom Life Show. Tyler, hello. Hello. Yes. Hi, Tom. Tyler. Yes. I can hear you. That's great. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm calling about, uh, uh, well, I need to know how you uh, succeeded in uh, stand-up comedy or how you ended up getting paid money doing that. Well, uh, the way I got paid in stand-up comedy is different from the route most people took. Right. Because I became known for doing funny things on the radio. Okay. And then I told people that I was going to make an appearance in public. It's a lot easier than yeah. starting from scratch at small comedy clubs and working your way up and trying to get name recognition. The hardest thing right. for comedians is getting name recognition. Yeah, and and even even the biggest name comedians are frequently unknown to most of the public. Yes, I know that. So uh, it's a matter of uh, becoming known. I mean, Dane Cook is well known for having used his MySpace page to build a career out of it. <laughs> Dane Cook. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, oh, laugh great. at Dane. I like him. He's a good. He's commentator. been on our show. Laugh at Dane Cook, if you will. But the guy took a MySpace page and turned it into a career. Right. Oh, I don't hate Dane Cook at all. I, I I like anyone who is doing something with their lives, someone, you know, yeah. doing what they love. Well, Dane Cook, by, by the way, Dane Cook went from MySpace page to stand-up comedy to play in big venue stand-up comedy to playing a romantic lead in a movie with Jessica Alba. I mean, the guy right. has had an incredible career. He's doing great. I'm I'm so proud of him. Plus, he's hosted Saturday Night Live and came back for do a few cameos there. I right. mean, I, I give the guy a lot of credit, and and by the way, I like yeah. him as a person. He's a nice guy, and uh, I got nothing bad to say about Dane Cook. You you could learn from that guy, right? Oh, I watch him anytime he's on. I'll watch him to learn. I mean, I might not laugh at his jokes so much, but I'm just looking to see what he's doing. You know, like how he's presenting himself and things like that. Uh, when I watch any good comic, and uh, basically, uh, I don't know. My, I would have an audience that, uh, I don't know, generally my audience is, uh, uh, lack understanding, I guess, of me. I grew up, uh, in Japan. I'm a, I'm white, but I grew up in Japan, so I talk a lot about that. Right. And I, I get a lot of, uh, like blank stares. I get laughs too, you know, but, uh, that's not what I'm trying to get at. I'm kind of a pussy when it comes to, you know, the business side of, uh, comedy, you know, getting myself up at these uh, major venues, these paid venues. Well, Tyler, you better lose that soon right. because you're not an artist, okay? You are a vendor. You're selling a product. The product just happens to have your name. Right. And you have to sell yourself like you're selling a, a box of Jello. I mean, you, you have to market yourself. Almost sell out. It's not selling out. Every comedian on stage is hoping to be discovered by The Tonight Show or right. by Letterman or by Comedy Central or get discovered to do a sitcom based on uh, his routine. Right. Everybody. I mean, how many pure comics are out there who don't care if they ever make a living? None. Everybody. Yeah. And that's yeah. like when people talk about bands. Oh, this band sold out. What band isn't looking for a record contract? That's right. I mean, well, I guess selling out are those I say those types that will do anything, even if it's a crappy uh, show or you know what I mean, like go on uh, on something that you don't really support or like just because you're getting money. Hey, don't knock them because right. they've got something you don't have: visibility and money. Right. Uh, I mean, so you're, I, you know, I learned yeah, a long you, time ago. I learned a long time ago. Not to make fun of people who are successful, even if they're successful doing something that I personally don't like. Right. Yeah. I mean, because it's all about business. And I look beyond the content of people's creative material to the business model. Mm. Can they make money doing this? You're not going to hire someone if you, you see that they're not a good fan. Look, if you're a comedian, you can't pack the house with 300 people or whatever. You're not going to get hired for gigs, right. and no That's one will hard. ever hear your work. 
Yeah, when I first started, people would come out, my friends, oh, you're doing comedy now? Okay, I'll check it out. And then they'll see my show once, maybe twice, and then I, it looks like you got to make more friends after that, you know, because those friends are done. Or you got to write a lot more material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New jokes. Well, how many times are people going to go see the same jokes? Exactly. I wouldn't. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I mean, seriously, advice, huh? you know, if you've got 20 minutes of good material and your friends have seen it two or three times, you know, their patience is wearing thin. I mean, they're, they're going right. to go look for new entertainment. Well, I'd punch me in the face if, <laughs> if I had to pay, pay money to see the same thing. Well, do you know how many comedians? Come on, you go to comedy clubs. How many comedians are doing the same material they were doing two years ago? Uh, almost all of them, at least a couple jokes. You know? Well, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, me too, actually. Mm-hmm. I tend to do, if I go up at a big show, you know, where I have people coming, uh, when I have people that I know come to see me, I, I really want to do well. I'm going with the stuff that I know that works instead of uh, putting my neck out there and taking a risk. Well, you should. This is the time to be taking that risk. This is the time to be doing the outrageous stuff or the stuff that people haven't tried before. This is the time, right? I mean, imagine you're locked into being George. And again, I think he's a good comedian, and he's been on our show, and uh, uh, we consider him a friend, George Lopez. George now, Lopez. I mean, now he's the George Lopez persona. Yep. He as as good as his stuff is. He has to be that. If he goes on stage and does something else, like he tries uh, to be George Carlin or he tries right. to be, uh, you know, somebody else, the audience will reject it now. Yeah, because you've got this that. This is what stick. you have now. By the way, this uh, is when you should be doing that. Right, and see and find what your stick is, whatever it is you right. want to call it, your voice. Yeah. And, hmm. and yes, push the boundaries. Absolutely. Yeah. When I do push boundaries, people end up getting really mad. But I'm sure you're familiar with that. And that's I am. Like why I, you the point are is, don't do it the way Michael Richard. Don't do it the way Michael Richards do it, did it. Okay? Oh no, that was no, just, no, no. That was stupid. That was dumb. Okay. I mean, but there's other ways to push boundaries. Keep right. in mind, as I've always said about my radio program, um, every time there's a big FCC controversy, I always go to the management and they say they still haven't taken away misogyny and blasphemy. <laughs> yep, you see what yep. I'm saying? And that's how I stay in business. You know, after Janet, just to give you an example in my own business, after Janet Jackson bared her breast on TV and the FCC cracked down on everybody, uh -huh. Lots of guys lost their jobs. Lots of guys had no material. Lots of guys said, what am I going to do now? Right. There's one person who kept at it and continued to refine the work until we're number one again. Uh -huh. who, and who we don't that? break the law and we don't get fined by the FCC because we don't do that stuff. Yeah, I don't understand FCC and their priorities at all. But you, but you hear what I'm telling you. Yeah. Like, if, if there's particular things you know that are going to hurt your business, you don't do those things. Right. But mm -hmm. there are ways to be outrageous. You might, by the way, you're always going to offend some people. I offend people every day. Right. But you have to figure out who your core constituency is. Your audience. And then, we, as we say in the marketing field, super serve your core constituency. Figure uh -huh. out who your prime audience is and then do the outrageous stuff that they want from you. Right. And then if people who are not in your target audience, 50-year-old females or whoever you decide your audience isn't, if they get offended and they walk out, so what? It burnishes your reputation. Same with me. Guys yep. call and say, my wife hates your show. I say, that's how I know I'm doing it right. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, that's true. I got a little, uh, what do you call it, a, one of those comments on YouTube in one of my videos. This guy was really mad at me, and I thought, okay, this, kind of, this dumb ass is mad at me, so... I guess I'm doing something right. Am I allowed to say dumbass? Um, yes, you can say dumbass. Okay. So, yes. <laughs> yeah. What about a hole? You can say a hole. You can't say. You can't say, the, say whole the whole word. thing. They would bleep out the whole part, right? They bleep out the whole thing. Oh, uh, okay. I mean, let me explain how this works, okay? You can say ass, and you can say. Whole. Yes. <laughs> Not 
<laughs> just don't put them together. Yeah. I mean, it's that simple. Yeah. On TV, they actually bleep out the whole part. Well, you know, again, we're not on TV. This is the radio, and uh, different companies do it differently. But, uh, you know, I mean, for example, there's just some words. It depends on the context. Right. Like, if you're a rooster on a radio show, you can say cock a doodle do. You can say that. Yeah. Okay. But if you're not a rooster and you're not saying cock a doodle do, you might get in trouble. Right. If you subtract the doodle do, you're in trouble. Well, uh, for example, now, if I get even with somebody, I could say it was tit for tat. I could say that. Uh huh, uh huh. But, you know, if I said something else, I might get in trouble. Right. Uh, See how it works? And, uh, yeah, and and I guess it would be uh, similar with, you know, audiences, you know, as with the FCC. Well, you, you see, with audiences, uh, you don't have to worry about regulation. The, the market will regulate you. Yep. I mean, you don't want to be so outrageous that, that four-fifths of your audience w walks out. That's what Michael Richards found out, okay? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's not how outrageous you You want to be outrageous in a way that your core audience loves what you're doing, and people who weren't that hot on you anyway are now really offended. No. So it's a, yeah, I mean, like what I do on time. this show is I do the stuff. My guys are guys 18 to, 30, 18 to 40, 18 to 44, whatever. That's my audience. Yep. And so I do stuff that would be offensive to people who are outside of that uh, that target demographic. Guys 18 to 44. Women hate me. Girls hate me. Uh, your grandmother hates me. Guys over 45 are offended. They, they, well, yep. I never. you know. But but I don't care if they're offended. The, the, as long as I'm not offending my constituency, I will be as outrageous as they will let me be. Yeah, if you're offending people outside that, that means, like you said, you're doing your job right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And to give you an example, okay, um, if I can, I have a 40% Hispanic audience, okay? If there was an earthquake in Mexico, and Mexico has had earthquakes just like California, and I said, well, what the hell? Who cares? Like, yeah. Just something stupid like that. It's not uh, funny anyway. But if I said something like that, that would offend my target audience. Even if I thought something really ridiculous and stupid like that was funny, why would I want to offend my audience? I right. want to offend the people who are not in my audience, the people who are not my constituency. Right. You see? Uh-huh. So i got to figure out who, the, my, who is my audience. I had a guy come up to me after a show once and say, you know what, maybe you should consider doing your comedy in, you know, little Tokyo to Japanese people. And that's a, such a small audience, and so I realized i got to broaden my... Well, uh, not my only theory. that, I mean, it's, it's kind of racist if you think about it. I mean, you're an American, number one. Yeah. I mean, why should you have to do your act in Little Tokyo? Right. Maybe you don't want all of your material to be about being part Japanese. Yeah, oh, these days, actually, you know, you know, i got maybe ten minutes on that, and then the rest of it... The rest of it is just regular stuff. Perfect. So I'm okay. But there. to tell you, you should be playing in Little Tokyo. To me, that's a racist comment. And he was black. Well, <laughs> was he doing his act in uh, Compton? No. In, uh, oh. Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. All right, Tyler. It's been great talking to you. Best of luck with your career. I really mean it. Tom, 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 Tom Likas. One eight hundred. 5-800-TOM. Getting married or having a girlfriend doesn't make you any less alone than you already are. But you got someone in your bed, you got someone to, you know, be with. But you realize you could have someone different in your bed every night of the week. Every night could be a new adventure. The Tom Likas Show. That's great. 
So, uh, yeah, I'm calling about, uh, uh, well, I need to know how you uh, succeeded in uh, stand-up comedy or how you ended up getting paid money doing that. Well, uh, the way I got paid in stand-up comedy is different from the route most people took. Right. Because I became known for doing funny things on the radio. Okay. And then I told people that I was going to make an appearance in public. It's a lot easier than yeah. starting from scratch at small comedy clubs and working your way up and trying to get name recognition. The hardest thing right. for comedians is getting name recognition. Yeah, and and even even the biggest name comedians are frequently unknown to most of the public. Yes, I know that. So uh, it's a matter of uh, becoming known. I mean, Dane Cook is well known for having used his MySpace page to build a career out of it. <laughs> Dane Cook. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, oh, laugh at Dane. I like him. He's a good He's commentary. been on our show. Laugh at Dane Cook, if you will. But the guy took a MySpace page and turned it into a career. Right. Oh, I don't hate Dane Cook at all. I, I I like anyone who is doing something with their lives, someone, you know, yeah. doing what they love. Well, Dane Cook, by, by the way, Dane Cook went from MySpace page to stand-up comedy to play in big venue stand-up comedy to playing a romantic lead in a movie with Jessica Alba. I mean, the guy right. has had an incredible career. He's doing great. I'm I'm so proud of him. Plus, he's hosted Saturday Night Live and came back for do a few cameos there. I mean, right. I, I give the guy a lot of credit, and, and by the way, I like yeah. him as a person. He's a nice guy, and uh, I got nothing bad to say about Dane Cook. You, you could learn from that guy. Right. Oh, I watch him. Anytime he's on, I'll watch him to learn. I mean, I might not laugh at his jokes so much, but I'm just looking to see what he's doing, you know, like how he's presenting himself and things like that uh, when I watch any good comic. And uh, basically, uh, I don't know, my, I would have an audience that, uh, I don't know, generally my audience is, uh, uh, lack understanding, I guess, of me. I grew up, uh, in Japan. I'm a, I'm white, but I grew up in Japan, so I talk a lot about that. Right. And I, I get a lot of, uh, like blank stares. I get laughs too, you know, but, uh, that's not what I'm trying to get at. I'm kind of a pussy when it comes to, you know, the business side of, uh, comedy, you know, getting myself up at these uh, major venues, these paid venues. Well, Tyler, you better lose that soon right. because you're not an artist, okay? You are a vendor. You're selling a product. The product just happens to have your name. Right. And you have to sell yourself like you're selling a, a box of Jello. I mean, you, you have to market yourself. Almost to sell out. It's not selling out. Every comedian on stage is hoping to be discovered by The Tonight Show or right. by Letterman or by Comedy Central or get discovered to do a sitcom based on uh, his routine. Right. Everybody. I mean, how many pure comics are out there who don't care if they ever make a living? None. Everybody. Yeah. And yeah. That's like when people talk about bands. Oh, this band sold out. What band isn't looking for a record contract? That's right. I mean, well, I guess selling out are those, I say those types that will do anything, even if it's a crappy uh, show or, you know what I mean? Like uh, go on, uh, on something that you don't really support or like just because you're getting money. Hey, don't knock them because right. they've got something you don't have visibility and money. Right. Uh, I mean, so you're, I, you you're, know, I learned yeah, a long you, time ago. I learned a long time ago. Not to make fun of people who are successful, even if they're successful doing something that I personally don't like. Right. Yeah. I mean, because it's all about business. And I look beyond the content of people's creative material to the business model. Mm. Can they make money doing this? You're not going to hire someone if you, you see that they're not a good fan. Look, if you're a comedian and you can't pack the house with 300 people or whatever, you're not going to get hired for gigs, right. and no That's one will ever hear your work. Yeah, when I first started, people would come out. My friends, oh, you're doing comedy now? Okay, I'll check it out. And then they'll see my show once, maybe twice, and then I, it looks like you got to make more friends after that, you know, because those friends are done. Or you got to write a lot more material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New jokes. Well, how many friends. times are people going to go see the same jokes? Exactly. I wouldn't. 
Well, I mean, seriously, you know, if you've got 20 minutes of good material and your friends have seen it two or three times, you know, their patience is wearing thin. I mean, they're, they're going right. to go look for new entertainment. Well, I'd punch me in the face if, <laughs> if I had to pay, pay money to see the same thing. Well, do you know how many comedians? Come on, you go to comedy clubs. How many comedians are doing the same material they were doing two years ago? Uh, almost all of them, at least a couple jokes. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, me too, actually. Mm-hmm. I tend to do, if I go up at a big show, you know, where I have people coming, uh, when I have people that I know come to see me, I, I really want to do well. I'm going with the stuff that I know that works instead of uh, putting my neck out there and taking a risk. Well, you should. This is the time to be taking that risk. This is the time to be doing the outrageous stuff or the stuff that people haven't tried before. This is the time, right? I mean, imagine you're locked into being George. And again, I think he's a good comedian, and he's been on our show, and uh, uh, we consider him a friend, George Lopez. George now, Lopez. I mean, now he's the George Lopez persona. Yep. He as as good as his stuff is. He has to be that. If he goes on stage and does something else, like he tries uh, to be George Carlin or he tries right. to be, uh, you know, somebody else, the audience will reject it now. Yeah, because he's got this that. This is sort of what you and... have now. By the way, this uh, is when you should be doing that. Right, and see and find what your stick is, whatever it is you right. want to call it, your voice. Yeah. And, mm. and yes, push the boundaries. Absolutely. Yeah. When I do push boundaries, people end up getting really mad. But I'm sure you're familiar with that. And I am. I why I, you the are point is, don't do it the way Michael Richard. Don't do it the way Michael Richards did it. Did it? Okay. Oh, no, that was no, just, no, no. That was stupid. That was dumb. Okay. I mean, but there's other ways to push boundaries. Keep right. in mind, as I've always said about my radio program, um, every time there's a big FCC controversy, I always go to the management and they say they still haven't taken away misogyny and blasphemy. <laughs> yep, you see what yep. I'm saying? And that's how I stay in business. You know, after Janet, just to give you an example in my own business, after Janet Jackson bared her breast on TV and the FCC cracked down on everybody, uh -huh. Lots of guys lost their jobs. Lots of guys had no material. Lots of guys said, what am I going to do now? Right. There's one person who kept at it and continued to refine the work until we're number one again. Uh -huh. who, and we don't that? break the law and we don't get fined by the FCC because we don't do that stuff. Yeah, I don't understand FCC and their priorities at all. But you, but you hear what I'm telling you. Yeah. Like, if, if there's particular things you know that are going to hurt your business, you don't do those things. Right. But mm -hmm. there are ways to be outrageous. You might, by the way, you're always going to offend some people. I offend people every day. Right. But you have to figure out who your core constituency is. Your audience. And then, we, as we say in the marketing field, super serve your core constituency. Figure uh -huh. out who your prime audience is and then do the outrageous stuff that they want from you. Right. And then if people who are not in your target audience, 50-year-old females or whoever you decide your audience isn't, if they get offended and they walk out, so what? It burnishes your reputation. Same with me. Guys yep. come and say, my wife hates your show. I say, that's how I know I'm doing it right. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, that's true. I got a little, uh, what do you call it, a, one of those comments on YouTube of one of my videos. This guy was really mad at me, and I thought, okay, this, kinda, this dumb ass is mad at me, so... I guess I'm doing something right. Am I allowed to say dumbass? Um... Yes, you can say dumbass. Okay. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What about a hole? You can say a hole. Can't say. You can't say the, say the whole word. thing. They would bleep out the whole part, right? They bleep out the whole thing. Oh, okay. I mean, let me explain how this works, okay? You can say ass, and you can say whole yes <laughs> just don't put together. them together yeah i mean it's that simple yeah on tv say they actually bleep out the whole part well you know again we're not on tv this is the radio and uh, different companies do it differently but uh you know i mean for example there's just some words it depends on the context 
Right. Like, if you're a rooster on a radio show, you can say cock a doodle do. You can say that. Yeah. Okay. But if you're not a rooster and you're not saying cock a doodle do, you might get in trouble. Right. If you subtract the doodle do, you're in trouble. Well, uh, for example, now, if I get even with somebody, I could say it was tit for tat. I could say that. Uh huh, uh huh. But, you know, if I said something else, I might get in trouble. Right. Uh, you see how it works? And, uh, yeah, and and I guess it would be uh, similar with, you know, audiences, you know, as with the FCC. Well, you, you see, with audiences, uh, you don't have to worry about regulation. The, the market will regulate you. Yep. I mean, you don't want to be so outrageous that, that four-fifths of your audience walks out. That's what Michael Richards found out, okay? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's not how outrageous you You want to be outrageous in a way that your core audience loves what you're doing, and people who weren't that hot on you anyway are now really offended. No. so it's a, yeah. I mean, like, what I do on this time. show is I do the stuff. My guys are guys 18 to 30, 18 to 40, 18 to 44, whatever. That's my audience. Yep. And so I do stuff that would be offensive to people who are outside of that uh, that target demographic. Guys 18 to 44. Women hate me. Girls hate me. Uh, your grandmother hates me. Guys over 45 are offended. They, they, well, yep. I never. you know. But, but I don't care if they're offended. The, the, as long as I'm not offending my constituency, I will be as outrageous as right. they will let me be. Yeah, if you're offending people outside that, that means, like you said, you're doing your job right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And to give you an example, okay, um, if I can, I have a 40% Hispanic audience, okay? If there was an earthquake in Mexico, and Mexico has had earthquakes just like California, and I said, well, what the hell, who cares? Like, yeah. Just something stupid like that. It's not uh -huh. funny anyway. But if I said something like that, that would offend my target audience. Even if I thought something really ridiculous and stupid like that was funny, why would I want to offend my audience? I right. want to offend the people who are not in my audience, the people who are not my constituency. Right. You see? Uh-huh. So I got to figure out who, the, my, who is my audience. I had a guy come up to me after a show once and say, you know what? Maybe you should consider doing your comedy in, you know, little Tokyo to Japanese people. And that's a, such a small audience, and so I realized i got to broaden my... Well, not only yeah. that, I mean, it's it's kind of racist if you think about it. I mean, you're an American, number one. Yeah. I mean, why should you have to do your act in Little Tokyo? Right. Maybe you don't want all of your material to be about being part Japanese. Yeah, oh, these days, actually, you know, i got maybe ten minutes on that, and then the rest of it... The rest of it is just regular stuff. Perfect. So I'm okay. But there. to tell you you should be playing in Little Tokyo, to me, that's a racist comment. And he was black. Well, <laughs> was he doing his act in uh, Compton? No. In, uh, oh. Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I do. All right, Tyler, it's been great talking to you. Best of luck with your career. I really mean it. Tom, 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 Tom Likas, 1-800-5800-TOM. Getting married or having a girlfriend doesn't make you any less alone than you already are. If you got someone in your bed, you got someone to, you know, be with. But you realize you could have someone different in your bed every night of the week. Every night could be a new adventure. The Tom Likas Show. This show from our nation's capital, Hollywood, California. At 1 800 5800 Tom, it's our telephone number. Let's say hello here to State. How'd you get a name like State? Hey, Tom, how you doing? You I'm okay. Is that because hey, you've spent a lot of time at State? Actually, my full name is State Knee. I'm named after my dad, and then, you know, I just shortened it to make it easier. How did he get a name like that? He got it from his dad. And any further than that, I couldn't tell you. Maybe maybe uh, they spent time in a state penitentiary. Uh, I, I, you have I don't a brother know. named I, Federal? He, none of us have spent time in, in the state of federal penitentiary, but, you know. Well, just a weird name. I thought yeah. maybe it came from somewhere. But it's good. You see, it's good, because what it is is a conversation, so I repeat with the ladies. 
<laughs> it works out. I understand. Yeah. Yeah, Tom, I, I, I really have to call in. I just got to say, uh, you know what, I started, basically, I took this class before, uh, two years ago, and I dropped out, and I shouldn't have. And I got back into your class over the... Oh, you're talking about 101. You took 101, too. Yeah. Talking about 101. And I got back into your class uh, about two months ago. Oh, By the way, your there. train is arriving right now. I don't know if you noticed. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm at home, and you can hear all that. What do you live, where do you live in the train station? Where do you live? Uh, I'm pretty close to one. I'm in uh, West Covina, real close to the, the big train depot over here. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Kind of sucks when you're trying to sleep, but <laughs> other, than, other than that, it's it's fine, you know? So, I understand. Okay. But, but yeah, I got to say, you know, I, I've been taking your class uh, from about the last six months. Before that, I was a nice guy that you always talk about, you know, the one who's always taking the girl out to dinner, and she's on the phone text messaging or calling somebody else. And, uh, you know, eventually I just I got tired of doing that and being the one who's getting stepped all over. And now, right now, I'm talking to, uh, I'm talking to this girl now who listens to you, too. And now I, I realize that I'm the other guy now. Now I'm the guy that you tell us to be. It's like I'm the guy who's texting her saying, hey, are you done? You know, you want right. to do something? So I got to say, Tom, I got to say thank you. And I'm, I'm definitely not dropping out of this class again. I'm definitely going to stick with this one. And, uh, and uh, personally, I was telling Dean, I, I think you should run for president. I think the way that this classroom runs is the way that this country should be run. I agree. Get all those bitches in line. That's how you do John it. McCain that's be that's damned. That, that's how you got to do it. That's right. So, believe me, you'd win the California vote and wherever else you're on the air. That's for sure. Hey, our governor grabbed the ashes of how many women? Come on. <laughs> I, you know what? I, I could run against Schwarzenegger, and I could give him a run for his money. Oh, definitely. Because I, I would not deny grabbing women's asses. I'll tell you what. <laughs> I'll run on the ass grabber party. I was going to say, you'd base your entire campaign on that, wouldn't you? I, are you kidding me? I've grabbed more ass. I don't care how many asses he's grabbed. I've grabbed more. <laughs> that's the way to do it. See, now that, that's why I'm back in this class, because I'm trying to grab as many as you have, you know? That's right. It's, it's, that's how you got to do it. So nope. that's all I really have to say. I just wanted to say thank you. And to all the guys out there that are listening that are, may just be getting started in this class, don't drop out of this class. Take this class. This man knows what he's talking about. The professor knows. Do not challenge the professor. And for everybody who thinks they know more than the professor like I did, you don't. Trust me, you don't. You're going to get stepped on. You're going to get mad. And then what's going to happen? You're going to end up right back here in the, in the worst situation. So, Tom, I, I just got to say thank you for this class and thank you for doing this public service. And as long as you're going to be teaching, I'm going to be listening. State, thank you very much for that. 1-800-5800-TOM is our telephone number. Michael on the Tom Like His Show. Hello. Tom, how you doing, buddy? Doing great. I just wanted you. Previously, you were talking about obviously on uh, FCC radio broadcast, and you have to be careful with uh, the callers that call in, and, and, the, and the, obviously the cuss words that might be leaked out on the air. But don't you believe that it's just a sound, and there's just so much censorship in this, uh, censorship in this country that it's almost beyond belief that we can't say a word that sounds very familiar to, as to other words. For example, if we use the F word, we can't obviously use that word on the air. I understand that, according to the FCC. But if I were to say truck, there's not much difference between that word and the F word. I mean, don't you believe that there's just too much censorship in this country that we just don't allow that opportunity for people to just speak their mind and use the vocabulary that they want to use? Of course, but, uh, but, but you see, I, I have to be more pragmatic about it. I have a show to do every day. And so that may be true. In fact, I agree with what you're saying. But what can I do? Oh, I understand that. But, I mean, when you look at uh, just the images that are on TV and the censorship that, that, that occurs there, and, and um, obviously, you, again, have to be wary of what words are used on the air. I mean, do you think that it's almost overkill in the sense that we censor it so much that, I mean, people use those, yes. those words. It's part of the common vernacular that's used every day. I mean, it. I mean, don't you think it's overkill? We censor too yes, much in this country. Yes, I do. Although I, mean, I just, you know how I've made a living? I've made a living being outrageous within the context of the rules. Right, and I and I can understand that. But I just I just feel like there's just too much government control, and there's just they they sort of put their hand in just too much. Yeah, but then too many of your neighbors write to the government and say, "Please control it more." And it's wrong. I mean, it's not like we have a, 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 a monarchy in this country and the king decreed that the F-word's not allowed. 
Uh, you've got an awful lot of people in this country who write into the government and say, please, it's the public airwaves. You have to control what's going on. It's disgusting. And, Can and you imagine those, how your show would be if you were on, like, an XM? Uh, or you know, I've story. had this conversation. <laughs> Our show is as good as it can be. And I, I, I say this having heard radio shows that are now on satellite radio uh, that use uh, every word of the book. Um, some of the people did good shows in terrestrial radio, but when they go to satellite radio, it's interesting and shocking the first couple of days. And then after a while, pretty much you're listening to the same show. And it doesn't make shows consistently better. And I guess the, the topics that you cover, I mean, you can obviously do it on free radio or you could do it on I mean, let me give you an example, Michael. I don't know what kind of job you have, but I'd be willing to bet that you can't use the F word on your boss. There's no federal regulation about it. But if you came in and said, let's F our competition, F them hard, let's F them, um, I'm sure the boss would call you in for a meeting. Yeah, you're probably right. I, mean, I work in okay. a more professional environment. But believe and me, I would, would you be better at that. your job if you were free to tell your boss, let's F the competition? Right. No, you'd be just as good at what you do. No, I understand or, that. or just as I, untalented I, as what, at what you do. What, what satellite radio has exposed, and the people we're talking about know who they are, is yeah. that once they got to satellite radio, we discovered that all they had was the threat of saying the F word, and now they're saying it. But they don't have any material. They don't have any talent. You know, they would always say, well, if only we could get to satellite radio, we'd, that show would be so much better because it would be, be free to do whatever we want. And then when you turn them on, F this, F that, F this, F that. But, but it isn't that funny. It wasn't that funny before, and it's not that funny now. One thing I will say for Howard Stern, Howard Stern had a great show even when he was being censored. Even when he had constrictions and rules, his show was great. So yep. going to satellite radio, in my opinion, didn't make it better. He was already great, and, and he did not need satellite radio for that. Now, if he feels he does, and they gave him half a billion reasons to give it a shot, Great. <laughs> dollars, right? I'm behind him all the way. I think it's I, I'd love to see more guys get a half a billion dollars to do that. I think it's great. But my opinion is Howard Stern could have stayed doing what he was doing uh, for the rest of his life, being bleeped here and there now and then or maybe being bleeped a lot. He would still be the number one show in his time slot. He would still have millions upon millions of dollars in advertising revenue and he would still be revered as this big cultural icon. Well, I think I think you're you are primed to be, and not necessarily his replacement, but as far as free radio is concerned, I think that you, in a sense, I mean, don't take this the wrong way. I think in a, you have a huge opportunity to be the next Howard Stern. I mean, there's nobody that I've heard on the radio that comes close to just sort of being honest, being just uh, you know, being who you are. And and I think that you have a huge opportunity to be. And again, don't take this the wrong way, but being the next Howard Stern, being number one in radio, and I, well, I, I don't, I don't take that. I take that are. as a compliment. But uh, yeah, I think, I think the, the the subjects that you that you actually talk about are relevant. They're current. They're. I mean, your listeners need to understand that we all come from different backgrounds, Tom. But what you talk about is so true, and I just want your listeners to realize that. Again, we all come from different backgrounds. We could be, you know, blue collar workers, white collar workers, but. The, the information that you're providing is actually very universal. I think that everyone needs to realize when it comes to being smart, being educated, investing, and in some ways being selfish and taking care of number one, and that's us men. And I love the message that you're sending out there, and I just want you to continue to do that. And you've got a huge support base, and it's nationwide. I don't know what how how, how wide your, your, your show is broadcast, but... I would imagine you've got a huge number of supporters out there, and uh, stay what, stay doing what you're doing because you're phenomenal at it. Thank you so much. I appreciate the call. I really do. It's one eight hundred five eight hundred Tom. That's our telephone number. Let's say hi here to Victor on the Tom Likas show. Tom, Victor, how are you? Great. Tom, uh, I know you went to South America during your uh, trip, so. I'm from South America as well, so how did you enjoy it? And, you know, what, what did you do for fun out there? What, you know, what country I, are you from? From Uruguay, Montevideo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yep, yeah. I was I was uh, in in Uruguay. I was in uh, uh, Punta del Este. Tom, Tom, Tom Likas, one eight hundred five eight hundred. Tom, you are the most repulsive person I've ever heard on the radio. Well, thank you very much. I take that as a compliment. The Tom Likas Show.